Night of the Living Dead by John Russo Chapter 5 The cellar with its stark gray walls and dusty clutter was cold and damp. Cardboard cartons tied with cord and a hanging grid of pipework all looked dirty in the heavy shadows cast by bare light bulbs. The cartons took up much of the space. They varied in size from grocery boxes with faded brand names to large packing crates that might have contained furniture. The washing machine, an old roller type, sat off in a corner of the cellar near a makeshift shower stall. Lines for drying clothes were strung over the pipework so low that Harry was forced to duck under them as he walked from the stairs to the other side of the confining quarters. A pair of stationary tubs and an old metallic cabinet stood against one of the walls where Harry's wife, Helen, leaned over the faucet of one of the tubs, wetting a cloth with cold water. She looked up as Harry entered, but remained more interested in what she was doing at the moment. She wrung out the cloth, feeling it to ascertain that it retained the correct amount of dampness, and took it to where a young girl, their daughter, lay motionless atop a homemade work table. On a pegboard above the table, there were hanging tools and cables, and built into the table itself were drawers for smaller tools, screws and bolts, washers and so forth. Helen's movements were a little stiff in the coolness of the cellar. She was wearing a dress and sweater while a warmer coat was spread on the table under the little girl. Its sides flopped up and over her, covering her legs and chest. The woman bent over her daughter and wiped her head with the cool cloth. Harry quietly walked up behind Helen as she concentrated on caring for the girl, pulling the coat more securely around her. Without bothering to look up at Harry, she said, Karen has a bad fever now. Harry sighed with concern for his daughter. Then he said, there's two more people upstairs. Two? Yeah, Harry acknowledged. Then half defensively, I wasn't about to take any unnecessary chances. Helen remained silent while Harry awaited some sign that she approved of his decision. How did we know what was going on up there? He said finally, flinging his arms into the air with a shrug. Then he reached nervously to his breast pocket for a cigarette, produced a pack that turned out to be empty, and crumpled it in his hand and pitched it to the floor. He stepped over to the work table where there was another pack, snatched it up, and it too was empty. And with the same crumpling action, Harry discarded the pack, violently this time, the action spinning him into a position facing his wife and daughter. Helen continued to quietly swab the girl's forehead while Harry stared at them for a moment. Does she seem to be all right? Harry asked anxiously. Helen was silent, the daughter Karen motionless. Harry was sweating to the point where beads of sweat had formed all over his face. He waited, and seeing no answer forthcoming, changed the subject. They're all staying upstairs. Idiots, we should stick together. It's the safest down here. He went to his wife's purse and rummaged through the contents long enough to find a pack of cigarettes. He tore the pack open, yanked a cigarette out, lit it, and dragged in the first puff deeply. It made him cough slightly. They don't stand a chance up there. They can't hold those things off forever. There's too many ways they can get into the house up there. Helen remained silent, as if her respect and tolerance of her husband's ideas had long ago been dissipated. On the floor next to the workbench was a small transistor radio. Harry's glance fell on it, and he stabbed at it, scooped it up, and clicked it on. They had a radio on upstairs. Must have been civil defense or, I think it's not just us, this thing is happening all over. The tiny radio would pick up nothing but static, try as Harry might. He spun the tuning dial back and forth, listening anxiously, but across the receiving band, the transistor just continued to hiss. Harry held it up and turned it into various positions, trying for reception, spinning the tuner constantly. Still, nothing but hissing. He began pacing the room, holding the radio up and down and sideways with no results. This damned thing? Still just static. Helen stopped wiping her daughter's forehead, neatly folded the cloth, and draped it over the prostrate girl's brow. Gently placing her hand on her daughter's chest, she looked over toward her husband, who was still pacing around the cellar, his cigarette dangling from his lip, waving the little radio around in the air. The radio continued to emit nothing but static at varying volumes. Harry! He continued his fidgeting with the radio as though it had become an obsession. 
He moved near the wall at the foot of the stairs, holding it high and still spinning the dial. He was breathing and perspiring heavily. Harry, that thing can't pick up anything in this stinking dungeon. Her rising tone of voice stopped him. He turned and looked at her. About to cry, she brought her hands up to her face. Then shaking her head, she bit her lip and just stared at the floor. Looking at her, Harry's anger rose and swept over him, putting him momentarily at a loss for words. His face began twitching, his emotions searching for some vehicle of expression, until he pivoted violently and flung the radio across the room, smashing it against the wall and launched into an orgy of shouting. I hate you, right? I hate the kid. I want to see you die here, right? In this stinking place. My God, Helen, do you realize what's happening? Those things are all over the place. They'll kill us all. I enjoy watching my kids suffer like this. I enjoy seeing all this happen. Helen's head jerked toward him. She looked at him with an expression that was half anguish and half pleading. Karen needs help, Harry. She needs a doctor. She's, she's going to maybe die here. We have to get out of here, Harry. We have to. Oh yeah, let's just walk out. We can pack up right now and get ready to go, and I'll just say to those things, excuse me, my wife and kid are uncomfortable here. We're going into town. For God's sake, there's maybe 20 of those things out there, and there's more every minute. Harry's sarcasm did not help him to make his point with Helen. Rather, it increased her disgust with him and made her more bitter. But she knew shouting back at him would do no good. Attempting to reason with him was the only thing that ever stood a chance of changing his mind. Once he had convinced himself of something, provided you could convince him that he had thought up the new idea himself, giving him the opportunity of backing off from his previous position gracefully. There's people upstairs, Helen said. We should stick together. You said it yourself. Those people aren't our enemies, are they? Upstairs, downstairs, what's the difference? Maybe they can help us. Let's get out of here. A pounding sound interrupted her. Both she and Harry held their breath and listened. The sound repeated itself, coming from the door at the top of the stairs. They glanced anxiously at their helpless daughter. For a long moment, they were half convinced they were being attacked. But then they heard Tom's voice. Harry! More pounding. Harry just stared up at the door and did not answer the call. He was sticking to his decision not to open the door again or have anything to do with the people upstairs. Tears welled in Helen's eyes as her frustration and disappointment in her husband increased and swept over her. More pounding. Helen looked at Harry. She knew he was a coward. More pounding. Then a pause. Maybe Tom was going to give up. Helen leaped up and ran to the foot of the stairs. Yes! Yes, Tom! Harry, running after her, grabbed her shoulders from behind and stopped her. She squirmed and struggled to free herself. Harry, let me go, let me go. She struggled violently, and the force of her determination rather than her physical strength shocked Harry and cowed him. And he stepped away from her and just stared. His wife had never defied him openly like this before. Tom's voice again sounded through the barricaded door. Harry, Helen, we have food and some medicine and other things up here. Harry stared up at the door speechlessly. There's going to be a thing on the radio in 10 minutes, Harry. A civil defense thing to tell us what to do. Looking up at the door, Helen shouted, We're coming up, Tom. We'll be up in a minute. Harry spun and glowered at her. You're out of your mind, Helen. All it takes is a minute for those things to grab a hold of you and kill you. If they get in up there, it'll be too late to change your mind. Don't you see that? Can't you see that we're safe as long as we keep that door sealed up? I don't give a damn, she spat at him. I don't care, Harry. I don't care anymore. I want to get out of here. Go upstairs. See if someone will help us. Maybe Karen will be okay. Calming suddenly, she stopped shouting, got control of herself, and stepped toward Harry and spoke in a softer tone. Harry, please, for just a minute, we'll go up and see what's up there. We'll hear the radio, and maybe we can figure some way to get out of here. Maybe with all of us, we can make it, Harry. Harry, his adamancy weakening somewhat, took the cigarette from his mouth, exhaling the last puff, and dropped it to the floor. He stepped on it to snuff it out. The smoke came in a long stream through his pursed lips. 
Startlingly, Tom's voice penetrated again. Harry! Hey, Harry! Ben found a television upstairs. Come on up. We'll see the civil defense broadcast on TV. Harry wavered. Helen spoke soothingly to him, her tone an attempt to relieve the distress she thought he must feel in going against his original decision. Come on, let's go up. There'll be something on TV that tells us what to do. You can tell them it was me that wanted to go up. All right, on, Harry said. All right, this is your decision. We'll go up, but don't blame me if we all get killed. Her eyes fell away from him and she began mounting the stairs, taking the lead as he fell in behind so the people upstairs would know their coming up was her doing. Together, she and Harry began unboarding the cellar door. Chapter 6 Harry lifted the last heavy timber away, and the door came away from the jam with a creaking noise. Helen peered out into the dining area, and beyond that into the semi-darkened living room. Harry, standing behind his wife, felt tense and hostile, and angry with himself because he had reneged on his decision about the cellar. Helen, too, was overwrought, because of the emotional strain of her argument with Harry and the fact that she was about to meet strange people in an anxious circumstance. But only Tom and Barbara were in the living room. Barbara, overcome with nervous exhaustion and shock, was sleeping fitfully on the couch in front of the fire. In an effort to be friendly, Tom said, We can see the broadcast, I think, if the TV works. I have to go help Ben carry it downstairs. Judy is in the kitchen. I'll get her and she can take care of Karen for you while you're up here watching the television. Helen managed a smile to express her thanks, and Tom immediately turned on his heels and went into the kitchen to get his girlfriend. Helen moved over to the fire, seeking its warmth, and looked down at Barbara sympathetically and brushed back her hair and pulled the overcoat around her shoulders. Poor thing. She must have been through a lot, Helen said to no one in particular. Harry, during these moments, had been flitting all over the house from door to window to kitchen to living room, checking out the actual degree of security, which he felt was practically non-existent, and worrying about the imminence of attack at any second. Tom and Judy came out of the kitchen and Tom said to Helen, I think her brother was killed out there. And he nodded his head toward Barbara, who moaned softly in her fitful sleep, as though she had heard his comment. Ben came to the top of the stairs and began shouting, Tom, hey Tom, are you gonna give me a hand with this thing or ain't you? Tom, startled, aware of his procrastination, bolted for the upstairs to help Ben while Judy opened the cellar door and went down to watch Karen. Harry, still pacing around in his anxiety, strode briskly over to where his wife was looking after Barbara. Her brother was killed, Helen said, as if telling that to Harry might soften him and jolt him out of his self-interest. This place is ridiculous, Harry said. There's a million weak spots up here. Frightened suddenly by a noise, Harry paused in his pacing long enough to listen and ascertain to his satisfaction that it was only Tom and Ben struggling with the television, making their way down the steps. Helen glowered at Harry. You're a pain in the ass, she told him. Why can't you make the best of things and do something to help somebody instead of complaining all the time? Harry, not really hearing her, was staring through a slat in the barricaded front window into the gloom outside. I can't see a damn thing out there, he exclaimed. There could be 50 million of those things. I can't see a thing. That's how much good these windows do us. Ben, who with Tom had reached the landing with the heavy television set, arrived in time to hear the last part of Harry's remark. He glowered even as he moved with his end of the burden, but said nothing as he and Tom dragged two chairs together and gingerly deposited the TV on them in the center of the room. They hunted for an outlet, found it, then slid and walked the set on the two chairs until the cord was close enough to be plugged in. As Ben knelt behind the set to plug in the cord, Harry said, Wake that girl up. If there's going to be a thing on the tube, she might as well know where she stands. I don't want to be responsible for her. Shocked, Helen blurted, Harry, stop acting like a child. Ben got to his feet, his eyes flashing anger. I don't want to hear any more from you, mister. If you stay up here, You'll take your orders from me, and that includes leaving that girl alone. She needs rest. She's just about out of her head as it is now. Now we're just going to let her sleep it off, and nobody's going to touch her unless I say so. Ben stared Harry down for a moment to ascertain that he had been at least temporarily squelched. Then his hand plunged immediately to the television set. As he snapped it on, 
The occupants of the room jockeyed for vantage points in front of it, and there were a few baited seconds of dead silence as they all waited to see if the set would actually warm up. All eyes were on the tube. A hiss began and increased in volume. Ben twisted the volume all the way. A glowing band appeared and spread, filling the screen. It's on! It's on! Helen shouted. There were murmurs of excitement and anticipation, but the tube showed nothing. No picture, no sound. Just the glow and hiss of the tube. Ben's hand raced the tuning dial through the clicks of the various stations. Harry jumped up, fidgeting. Play with the rabbit ears. We should be able to get something. Ben fussed with horizontal and vertical, with brightness and contrast. On one station, he finally got sound. He adjusted the volume. The picture tumbled, he played with it, and finally brought it in. Full screen was a commentator in the middle of a news report. Hushed, the people in the room settled back to watch and listen. Assign little credibility to the theory that this onslaught is a product of mass hysteria. Mass hysteria, Harry snarled. What do they think? We're imagining all this. Shut up, Ben bellowed. I want to hear what's going on. Authorities advise utmost caution until the menace can be brought under absolute control. Eyewitness accounts have been investigated and documented. Corpses of vanquished aggressors are presently being examined by medical pathologists, but autopsy efforts have been hampered by the mutilated condition of these corpses. Security measures instituted in metropolitan areas include enforced curfews and safety patrols by armed personnel. Citizens are urged to remain in their homes. Those who ignore this warning expose themselves to intense danger. From the aggressors themselves and from armed citizenry whose impulse may be to shoot first and ask questions later. Rural or otherwise isolated dwellings have most frequently been the objective of frenzied, concerted attack. Isolated families are in extreme danger. Escape attempts should be made in heavily armed groups and by motor vehicle if possible. Appraise your situation carefully before deciding on an escape tactic. Fire is an effective weapon. These beings are highly flammable. Escape groups should strike out for the nearest urban community. Manned defense outposts have been established on major arteries leading into all communities. These outposts are equipped to defend refugees and to offer medical and surgical assistance. Police and vigilante patrols are in the process of combing remote areas in search and destroy missions against all aggressors. These patrols are attempting to evacuate isolated families, but rescue efforts are proceeding slowly due to the increased danger of night and the sheer enormity of the task. Rescue for those in isolated circumstances is highly undependable. You should not wait for a rescue party unless there is no possibility of escape. If you are few against many, you will almost certainly be overcome if you remain in one spot. The aggressors are irrational and demented. Their sole urge is their quest for human flesh. Sheriff Conan W. McClellan of the County Department of Public Protection was interviewed minutes after he and his vigilante patrol had vanquished several of the aggressors. We bring you now the results of that interview. On the TV screen, the image of the commentator was replaced by newsreel footage taken earlier that night. The footage showed dense woods, a dirt road, searchlights dancing among the trees, while men moved around peering into the darkness and shouting at one another. Sporadic distant gunfire could be heard over all this. Then the news camera showed footage of posted guards maintaining the periphery of a small clearing. Still, gunfire could be heard in the distance. Some of the men were smoking, others drinking coffee from paper containers or talking in small groups. The area was illuminated by a large bonfire. A closer shot revealed Sheriff McClellan, the central figure of the scene, shouting commands, supervising defensive measures, and at the same time trying to answer the reporter's questions as he paced around not straying too far because of the cord and microphone hanging around his neck. McClellan was a big man, gruff, and used to commanding men and making them do what they were told in some semblance of order. He was dressed in civilian clothes but carried a big rifle with scope and a belt of ammunition of heavy caliber. At the moment, he had some of his men engaged in dragging bodies to the bonfire and throwing them on it to burn. The crackle of the bonfire, the shouts and bustle of activity formed a constant background for McClellan's commentary as he did his best to answer what he was asked. 
while his primary concerns were his efforts in dealing with the aggressors and controlling his search party. Things ain't going too badly, McClellan said. The men are taking it pretty well. We killed 19 of those things today, right around this general area. These last three we found trying to claw their way into an abandoned mine shed. Nobody was in there, but these things just pounding and clawing, trying to bust their way in. They must have thought there was people in there. We heard the racket and sneaked up on them and blasted them down. What's your opinion then, Sheriff? Can we defeat these things? There ain't no problem, except just getting to them in time before they kill off all the people that are trapped. But me and my men can handle them okay. We ain't lost nobody or suffered any casualties. All you gotta do is shoot for the brain. You can tell anybody out there. All you gotta do is draw a sharp bead and shoot for the brain, or beat them down and lop their heads off. They don't go anywhere once you chop their heads off. Then you gotta burn them. Then I'd have a decent chance, even if I was surrounded by two or three of them. If you had yourself a club or a good torch, you could hold them off or burn them to death. They catch fire like nothing, go up like wax paper. But the best thing is to shoot for the brain. You don't want to get too close unless you have to. Don't wait for us to rescue you because if they get you too far outnumbered, you've had it. Their strength is in numbers. We're doing our best. But we only got so many men and a whole lot of open country to comb. But you think you can bring the situation under control? At least in our county, we got things in our favor now. It's only a question of time. We don't know for certain how many of them there are. But we know when we find them, we're able to kill them. So it's a matter of time. They are weak, but there's pretty many of them. Don't wait for no rescue party. Arm yourself to the teeth, get together in a group, and try to make it to a rescue station. That's the best way. But if you're alone, you have to sit still and wait for help. And we'll try like hell to get you before they do. What are these things, Sheriff? In your opinion, what are they? They're, they're dead. They're dead humans. That's all they are. Whatever brought them back and made them this way, I wish to God I knew. The television coverage had switched back to the live announcer, who resumed speaking in his matter-of-fact tone. You have heard Sheriff Conan W. McClellan of the County Department of Public Protection. This is your Civil Defense Emergency Network, with reports every hour on the hour for the duration of this emergency. Remain in your homes. Keep all doors and windows locked. Do not under any circ... Ben reached over and clicked off the television. Excited, Tom said, Why'd you shut it off for? Ben shrugged. The man said the reports only come on every hour. We heard all we need to know. We have to try and get out of here. Helen agreed. He said the rescue stations have doctors and medical supplies. If we could get there, they could help my daughter. Harry laughed scornfully. How are we going to bust out of here? We have a sick girl, a woman out of her head, and this place is crawling with those things. Willard is the nearest town, Tom said, ignoring Harry's objections. They'd have a checkpoint there, about 17 miles from here. You from here? You know the area? Ben asked excitedly. Sure, Tom replied confidently. Judy and I were going swimming up the road. We heard the news on her portable radio, and we came in here and found the lady dead upstairs. Not too long after, Harry and his wife and kid fought their way in here. I was scared, but I opened the basement door and let them in. Well, I think we ought to stick right here and wait for a rescue party, Harry said. That fellow on the TV said, if you're few against many, you don't have a chance. We can't hike 17 miles cross country through that army of things out there. We don't have to tramp, Ben said. My truck's right outside the door. This stopped Harry. There was a long moment of silence while the fact of the truck sank into everybody's head. But I'm just about out of gas, Ben added. There's a couple of gas pumps by the shed out back, but they're both locked up. The key ought to be around somewhere, Tom said. There's a big key ring in the basement. I'll go look. In his enthusiasm, now that escape seemed to be a possibility, he bolted for the cellar door and scampered down the stairs. Ben turned to Harry. Is there a fruit cellar down there? Yeah, why? We're gonna need lots of jars. We can make Molotov cocktails, scare those things back, then fight our way to the pump and gas up the truck. We're gonna need kerosene then, Harry said. There's a jug of that in the basement too. Helen said, Judy and I can help. 
We can rip up sheets and things. Then she added in a hushed tone, I don't think Barbara's going to be much help at all. How do you know her name? Ben asked, startled. She was mumbling it in her sleep. Something about her brother telling her over and over. Barbara, you're afraid. It must have happened just before he died. There was a sudden clatter and Tom came up out of the cellar. Here's the key ring, he said. The pump key is marked with a piece of tape. I talked with Judy. She's in favor of trying to escape. Good, Ben said. Then nothing's holding us back. Anybody who's got any second thoughts better decide now. If that's the key for sure, we're in good shape. But we should take a crowbar anyway, in case the key doesn't work. The crowbar can double as a weapon for whoever goes with me. But I don't want to get all the way out there and find out we can't get the pump open. I'll go, Tom said. You and me can fight our way to the pump. The women can stay in the cellar and take care of the kid. We should have a stretcher. Helen and Judy maybe can make one. Ben turned to Harry and spoke sternly, emphasizing his words. Harry, you're going to have to guard the upstairs. Once we unboard the front door, those things can get in here easily. But it has to stay unlocked, so me and Tom can get back in after we get back here with the truck. You've got to guard the door and unlock it for us right away, because we'll probably come flying on the run with a bunch of those things coming right behind us. We'll board the door up again as fast as we can once we're safe inside the house. If we don't get back, well, then you'll be able to see from upstairs, and you can barricade the door again and go to the basement. You and the rest can sit tight and hope for a rescue party. Facing Ben, Harry said, I want the gun then. It's the best thing for me to use. You're not going to have time to stop and aim. Ben cut him off in no uncertain terms. I'm keeping this gun. Nobody else lays a hand on it. I found it, and it's mine. Harry said, How do we know you and Tom won't just get the truck gassed up and cut out? Ben glowered, trying to control his anger. That's the chance you have to take, he said evenly and forcefully. If we cut out, you'll have your goddamn basement, like you've been crying about all along. We're going to die here, Helen said pleadingly, if we don't all work together. Ben looked at her, sizing her up. He had pretty much decided she was not a coward, like her husband. He'd almost rather have her guarding the front door. But she was not nearly as strong as Harry, provided he did not chicken out. Ben addressed all of them in commanding tones. Let's get busy. More of those things are coming to surround us all the time, and we've got a lot to do if we're going to bust out of here. If everything goes right, two or three hours from now, we'll be taking a hot shower in the Willard Hotel. Nobody laughed. They separated, each to begin his or her assigned task. Ben turned the radio back on. It began repeating its recorded message. The time was approximately 11.30. One half hour to go until midnight, when there would be another regular broadcast. It would come in the middle of their escape preparations. They could take time out to watch it on the television, in case it contained current information that might prove helpful. In the meantime, there was nothing to do but to work hard and to hope. Chapter 7 Helen and Harry Cooper came down into the basement and found Judy watching over the sick girl, Karen, who now seemed a little delirious. She tossed and turned and moaned softly now and then as she lay on the makeshift work table. Has she asked for me? Helen asked intently. Has she spoken at all? Harry reached down and covered his daughter, where she had shaken off the coat that was covering her in her delirium. She's been moaning and crying out constantly, Judy said, her face showing her worry and concern for the child. Poor baby. Helen sighed, and she touched her hand to Karen's forehead and felt the increase of fever. Get another damp cloth, Harry said. I'm going to start making a stretcher. Judy, I'll give you the box of fruit jars over there, and you take them up to Tom. He'll have to come down here for the kerosene. We're going to make Molotov cocktails. The idea of making something like that seemed weird to Judy, like something she had seen, but only vaguely understood, from the movies. She knew a Molotov cocktail was something that caught fire when you threw it at a tank, but she had no idea how to make one. But she stood waiting patiently while Harry dug out the old dusty box of fruit jars and loaded it into her arms. It wasn't heavy, but she was too loaded down to carry anything else. You'll have to send Tom back down for the kerosene, Harry repeated. Helen and I will take care of Karen and start making the stretcher. Tell Tom to bring us some old sheets or blankets. 
Harry watched after her as she climbed the stairs out of the cellar as though she would be likely not to do it right if he didn't watch her. We'll be damned lucky if we make it, he said, turning to Helen. It would be tough enough for half a dozen men to beat their way through those things. Helen looked up from where she had been applying her dampened cloth to Karen's forehead. She didn't say anything to combat Harry's pessimism. She merely trembled. As her eyes looked into the fever-tossed, agonized face of her young daughter, she caught her breath and almost did not dare to hope that they would make it. Lord help us, she mumbled when her breath came to her again. Over by the workbench, Harry had begun pounding on something in his effort to fashion a crude stretcher. Chapter 8 Ben had returned to the vacant room, which contained the mutilated corpse of the old lady who had once lived there. The vacant room was the one that looked out onto the front lawn, and Harry would have to station himself there to toss Molotov cocktails from the window. Ben held his breath and tried not to look at the corpse, but he knew he had to get it out of the room. Seeing a thing like that was the very thing which was likely to spook Harry and bring his cowardice trembling to the surface. And then he would panic and run and fail to do the job that was expected of him. The entire room smelled of the rotting corpse, which had been closed in there for a couple of hours. Ben had to step into the hall for a while to allow the room to air out. He went into the bathroom and lifted the window an inch or two and sucked cold night air into his nostrils. But the scent of the dead things outside came to him faintly, mingled with the normal odors of dampness and freshly cut grass and plowed fields. The man closed the bathroom window and returned to the room which he hated to enter. He began dragging the corpse out into the hallway and toward the child's room across the hall. On its blood-crusted carpet, it slid along fairly easily on the bare floor, but when it reached the rug in the child's room, it balked and was harder to drag. Ben grunted, gagged with the stench of a lungful of the dead woman's odor, and with a desperate heave got it into the room near the bunk bed, stepped over it quickly to get out of there, and slammed the door. Again, he went to the bathroom and opened the window enough to suck in fresh air. When he returned to the vacant room, it still smelled bad, but not as bad as before. He went to the window, taking pains to keep his body pressed close against the wall, where he could not be seen very easily. With his hand, he rubbed a clean spot on the dirty, uncurtained window. There were now at least 30 of the things standing down there on the front lawn, and in the fields beyond, several more could be seen, making their way toward the house. Chapter 9 Barbara was sitting up by the fire. She had a morose, almost vacant expression on her face, as though she no longer cared whether she lived or died. In the corner of the room that had once been the dining area, Tom and Judy were making Molotov cocktails. Judy was using a pair of scissors to cut up an old bed sheet into strips, while Tom was filling the fruit jars with kerosene from a can. Then together, they began soaking the cloth strips in kerosene in the bottom of a dish and forcing these makeshift fuses through holes which Tom had cut in the caps of the jars. They worked silently for a long time, but when Judy looked over at Barbara, sitting so inert and morbid on the sofa with the fire flickering in her face, she felt a need to make conversation to relieve the silence. Tom, do you think we're doing the right thing? She asked suddenly, looking up from her task with the fuses. She stared at her hands with the odor of kerosene coming off them. Tom looked at her and smiled, tensely but reassuringly. Sure, honey, I don't think we have a chance if we stay here. There are more and more of those things all the time. The television broadcast advised anyone who was in a situation like ours to try to escape. But what about the rescue parties? We can't take a chance on waiting. Nobody might ever come to help us. Think how many people must be trapped like we are. Judy fell silent as she returned to her task with the fuses. I think we're going to make it, Tom said. We're not all that far from the gas pumps, and Ben said he beat down three of those things before, and now we have the gun. He looked at her intently, noticing the worried look on her face, which he had never before seen in the short time they had been going together. But why do you have to be the one to go out there? She said finally. Honey, you're talking like Harry Cooper now. Somebody has to go. We can't just sit here and wait for those things to kill us. Besides, we're going to be all right. You wait and see. We're going to make it. She leaned forward and put her arms around him, awkwardly, trying to touch him with her kerosene hands. 
About to kiss, they were startled by the loud sound of Harry's footsteps coming up out of the basement. A tense look on his face, he entered the room and said angrily, What's the matter? Doesn't anybody keep their head around here? It's almost time for another broadcast. Five more minutes, Tom said, looking at his wristwatch. Well, we got to get the damn thing warmed up, Harry said, and he stepped over to the television and turned it on just as Ben came down from the upstairs. What's going on, Ben said. Another broadcast, Tom answered, and to show Ben he had not been loafing, he continued working with the fuses, dipping them and forcing them into the bottles. Ben moved over to Barbara and looked at her, shaking his head sadly. God damn this television, Harry said. It takes half a century to warm up. We could all die waiting for it. He nervously struck a match and lit a cigarette, while the picture tube began to glow and the sound came on. We've got to get that girl down into the basement, Harry added with a glance in Barbara's direction. She's no good to herself or anyone else up here. Nobody made a reply to Harry's comment, and they all fell silent as the news broadcast came on. It was a different commentator, but the newsroom was the same, with its multitude of clocks on the wall showing what time it was in various parts of the nation and its background of ticker tape sounds and blurred human voices. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now midnight Eastern time. This is your civil defense network with reports every hour on the hour for the duration of this emergency. Stay tuned to this wavelength for survival information. Ladies and gentlemen, incredible as it may seem, the latest report from the president's research team at Walter Reed Hospital confirms what many of us have accepted as fact without bothering to wait for official confirmation. The army of aggressors, which has besieged many of the eastern and midwestern sections of our country, is made up of dead human beings. Judy shuddered as the announcer paused, allowing time for his statement to sink in. The expression on his face showed that he hardly believed it himself. I didn't need him to tell me that, Ben said. Quiet, Harry yelled. The recently dead have been returning to life and feasting on human flesh. Dead people from morgues, hospitals, funeral parlors, as well as many of those killed during or as a result of the chaos created during this emergency, have been returned to life in a depraved, incomplete form with an urge to kill other humans and devour their flesh. Explanations for the causes of this incredible phenomenon have not been forthcoming from the White House or from positions of authority, but speculation centers on the recent Venus probe, which was unsuccessful. That rocket ship, you remember, started for Venus more than a week ago, but never got there. Instead, it returned to Earth, carrying a mysterious high-level radiation with it. Could that radiation have been responsible for the wholesale murder we are now witnessing? Speculation on the answer to that question has run rampant here in Washington and elsewhere, while the White House has maintained a curtain of silence and has attempted to deal with this emergency by physical means. That is, by organizing resistance and search and destroy missions against the aggressors. Meetings at the Pentagon and the White House have remained closed to reporters, and members of the military and civilian advisors have refused to conduct interviews or to answer questions thrust at them by reporters on the way to or from such meetings. However, the latest official communique from the Pentagon has confirmed that the aggressors are dead. They are not invaders from another planet. They are the recently dead from right here on Earth. Not all of the recently dead have returned to life. But in certain areas of the country, the East and Midwest in particular, the phenomenon is more widespread than elsewhere. Why the Midwest should be an area so greatly afflicted is not easily explained even by the most calculated speculation. The Venus probe, you remember, crashed in the Atlantic Ocean just off the eastern seaboard. Perhaps we shall never know the exact reasons for the terrible phenomenon we are now witnessing. There is some hope, however, that the menace will be brought under control. Perhaps in a matter of several days or weeks, the aggressors can be killed by gunshot or a heavy blow to the head. They are afraid of fire and they burn easily. They have all the characteristics of dead people, except they are not dead. For reasons we do not as yet understand, their brains have been activated and they are cannibals. In addition, anyone who dies from a wound inflicted by the flesh eaters may himself come back to life in the same form as the aggressors themselves. The disease that these things carry is communicable through open flesh wounds or scratches and takes effect minutes after the apparent death of the wounded person. 
Anyone who dies during this emergency should be immediately decapitated or cremated. Survivors will find these measures difficult to undertake, but they must be undertaken anyway, or else the authorities must be alerted to undertake it for you. Those who die during this emergency are not corpses in the usual sense. They are dead flesh, but highly dangerous and a threat to all life on our planet. I repeat, they must be burned or decapitated. A shudder went through Harry and all the eyes in the room turned on him. How did your kid get hurt? Ben asked. One of those things grabbed her while we were all trying to run. I'm not sure, but I think she was bitten on the arm. They all stared at Harry, feeling sorry for him, but realizing at the same time the threat Karen would be to them if she died. You or Helen had better stay with her at all times, Ben warned. If she doesn't pull through, well, his voice trailed off. Harry covered his face with his hands as he tried to accept the thought of what he would have to do. Knowing his daughter might die had been bad enough, but now, another shudder went through him. The people in the living room had their eyes glued to the tube and were avoiding looking in Harry's direction. You'll have to tell Helen what to expect, Ben said. Otherwise, she won't know how to deal with it if it happens. Ben thought of his own children and trembled with anguish and homesickness for them. Then he forced his attention back to the television in case he might learn something that would be of value in trying to escape. But the tube faded to a glow. The broadcast was over. Clattering his chair, Tom got to his feet. We'd better get started, he said. There's nothing more we can do here. Ben slung his gun over his shoulder as he bent to pick up a claw hammer and crowbar. Facing Harry, he said, you've got to station yourself in the empty room upstairs. All women will stay in the cellar. Soon as Tom and I have the front door unboarded, you start tossing the Molotov cocktails. Make sure they catch fire good, throw every one of them, but don't hit the truck. If you can catch a couple of those things on fire, so much the better. When we hear your footsteps on the stairs, me and Tom will be gone. It'll be up to you, Harry. You've got to guard the front door. Got yourself a good length of pipe? I have a pitchfork. Good. Okay. While Ben delivered his instructions, Tom knelt near the fire and soaked a table leg in kerosene so it would make a good torch. With a little coaxing, Judy got Barbara to her feet and ushered her down into the basement. But Tom turned as he had heard only one pair of feet descending the stairs. Judy stood looking at him from behind the half-open cellar door, an anguished look on her face as Harry left the room with his box of Molotov cocktails and Tom began to help Ben unboard the front door. Judy worried and watched in silence, while the man and the boy engaged in the painstaking work of very quietly undoing the barricade, so as not to give alarm to the lurking things outside. With crowbar and claw hammer, slowly and carefully, both Tom and Ben worked on each piece of lumber. Each nail creak was a menace. They were alert to the constant danger, until the barricade was finally undone. Tom lit the torch and handed it to Ben, and they posted themselves by the door waiting for the Molotov shower to begin. Ben shifted the curtain and peered outside, sizing up the situation they were about to plunge themselves into. On the lawn under the trees, many shadowy figures were lurking, silent and threatening in the darkness. Several of the dead things were standing near the truck. It was going to be a hard fight for Tom and Ben to get into it. And across the field, along the route that the truck would have to take to the gas pumps, Many more of the flesh eaters were watching and waiting. If anything went wrong, they would never get back to the house alive. Judy still had not gone down into the cellar. Her eyes were fastened on Tom, as if she wanted to continue seeing him until the last possible moment, because once he was gone out into the night, she might never see him again. Suddenly, a cry from upstairs. A window flew open and the first fiery blaze lit the yard. Ben flung the front door open, and in the glow of the blazing kerosene fire, he watched as the creatures moaned with their hideous rasping sounds and began clutching at themselves dumbly and backing slowly away. More cocktails followed, crashing in the yard with a splintering sound as the flames leaped up and illuminated the old truck and the eerie dead things that had been stationed around it. Several of the things caught fire and walked and staggered with the flames their dead flesh popping and crackling and burning with a terrible stench, until they were consumed by the fire and brought down by it, not killed but immobilized, 
still moving and making rasping sounds until there was not sufficient body left to continue to move any longer. Still the bombs showered from upstairs. The field beyond the house was now lit up dimly, the shadows of trees and bushes moving eerily and changing complexion as each new puddle of fire took hold and the flames rose and fell. Ben and Tom stood on the porch, watching the dead things burning and backing away while they kept their weapons ready to use on any of the beings who might attack before they were to make their break for the truck. That's all, Ben! Run for it! Harry shouted from upstairs, slamming the door to the vacant room and scurrying for the stairs. His voice echoed as Tom and Ben burst into the yard, surrounded by puddles of flame and threatened by the dead ghouls, some of which were starting to move forward, their fear of fire not as strong as their urge for human flesh. Tom clubbed at one of the attackers with the crowbar and it went down, but it was still struggling on the ground. Ben stabbed at it with the torch and it caught fire and burst into a blaze as it began to die, clutching at itself. Harry had gotten to the front door, too late to stop Judy from running out onto the lawn. I'm going with them, she screamed, and Harry clutched at her, but she ran right by him and stopped, caught short when he slammed the front door. Two of the ghouls were coming for her. She could not get back inside, and her way to the truck was blocked. She screamed, and Ben turned and saw her while Tom leaped into the driver's seat of the truck. One of the things was clutching at him, and he had to drive it back by kicking it hard in the chest. Ben wheeled and clubbed at the two ghouls in front of Judy. The shock of the rifle thudded against their dead skulls and brought them to the earth, each with a sickening crunch and a splintering of bone that was already dead. Ben grabbed the frightened girl and pushed her into the truck, then leaped into the bed of it as Tom's eyes fell on Judy and the truck lurched out. It careened and skidded in a U-turn for the old shed and the gas pumps across the field. Several ghouls clawing and pounding at the humans inside fell away from the truck as it moved, and Ben set still another one on fire with his torch and beat at it as it continued to try to hang on even while it was burning until it was shaken loose finally and fell with its head under the tire of the truck. Temporarily in the clear, Tom raced the truck across the field, while many of the ghouls followed after, staggering slowly but in relentless pursuit of their objective. Ben aimed and fired several shots, cocking and firing in rapid succession, and wasting ammunition, actually, as most of his shots missed as the truck jounced over the ruts in the grassy field, but one creature went down with half its skull blown completely away. The others continued to follow after the old truck as it screeched to a halt in front of the gas pumps in the shed and Tom and Ben leaped out. Still more attackers were approaching, several parties of them now making their way across the field. Tom fumbled with the key to the locked pumps. Ben shoved him back, hurriedly aimed the gun and fired, blowing the lock to pieces. Gas spurted all over the place as Ben handed the torch to Tom so he would have some means of protecting himself. He had left his crowbar in the truck. Her eyes wide with fear, Judy stared through the windshield, first at Tom, then out into the field, as the creatures continued to advance. Several of them were less than 30 yards away. Gas still spurting, Tom crammed the nozzle into the mouth of the gas tank, and his torch fell from his hands under the gasoline-soaked ground. Tongues of flame leaped up and set fire to the truck. The rear fender was burning. Ben saw it out of the corner of his eye as he crouched and leveled off with his weapon and fired. An approaching attacker went down but got back up again, a gaping hole in its chest, just below the neck. In force of numbers, the attackers continued to advance. Tom stared at the truck as the flames began to lick and spread. Ben stared too, momentarily, he did not know what to do. Then he wheeled and yelled as Tom leaped into the flaming truck and it lurched and skidded across the field, plowing down some of the attackers in its way. Tom wanted to get the truck away from the gas pumps to prevent them from exploding. Ben yelled again, but to no avail, as the flaming truck sped away, driven by the panicked Tom, Judy scared speechless beside him in the front seat. Several of the things were upon Ben, he thrashed and pounded at them with the torch and gun. Figuring that Tom was lost, he knew he had to try and fight his own way back to the house. Ben succeeded in setting fire to two of the ghouls that were attacking him and beating a third one to the ground. 
He ran, swinging the torch and gun, spinning in all directions so as not to be brought down from behind. The stench of the ghouls alone was almost overpowering, as mobs of them threatened to close in and tear him apart. From inside the house, Harry had been able to see only pieces of the action, although he kept darting back and forth from door to window, squinting through the barricades, trying to make sure of what was going on outside. From his point of view, the escape attempt seemed to have met with total doom, and if so, he wanted to lock the front door and run into the basement and barricade it. Harry saw the truck catch fire and saw Tom drive it away. As for Ben, he appeared to be overwhelmed. Harry ran to another window. The truck, almost completely in flames, was speeding away from the house toward a small rise. Eerily, it was lighting up its own path as it lurched and bounced along in the otherwise pitch black field. Suddenly, it screeched to a halt. Harry could see a figure, that of Tom, crawling out of the driver's side and trying to help Judy get out too. Then, an overpowering blast. The truck exploded violently, the noise and flames shattering the night. In the midst of his struggles with the ghouls, Ben looked up and shuddered as he realized what had happened to Judy and Tom. The flames from the exploded truck helped him to see his way clear to fight a little nearer to the house. With powerful, desperate blows from his torch and gun, Ben continued to beat back his attackers in a life-or-death attempt to gain safety. Several ghouls were at the front door, trying to beat their way into the house. From inside, Harry was in complete terror. Finally, heedless of anybody's plight but his own, he panicked and bolted for the cellar. But Ben had slugged his way through the attackers on the porch, and now he was pounding for admission at the front door. Spinning with a powerful lunge, he kicked the last attacker off the porch. In the rebound, he plowed his shoulder against the door. It crashed open and Ben burst through in time to catch Harry at the cellar door. But there was no time to redress Harry. Ben turned frantically to return boarding the door as his eyes met Harry's for an instant and they both fell to work as if Harry thought he could maintain some vestige of respect in Ben's eyes by pitching in and helping now. They managed to get the door boarded up. The house was temporarily safe. They turned and looked at each other, Harry shaking with fear, sweat streaming from his face. Both men knew what was coming, and Ben's fist crashed against Harry's face, even as he was attempting to back away. Harry was driven back, one punch after another, until Ben cornered him and slammed him against the wall and held him there, staring into his face. Ben spat his words out, each word punctuated by an additional slam of Harry against the wall. You rotten goddamn next time! You do something like that! I'll drag you outside and feed you to those things! Ben slammed him one final time and he slid down the wall and crumpled on the floor, his face bruised and his nose streaming with blood. Ben moved to the cellar door. Come on up! It's us! It's all over! Tom and Judy are dead! He pivoted, hurled himself across the room to a window, and saw the ghouls moving closer to the house. Despite his exhaustion, he shuddered. What on earth were they going to do now? Chapter 10 By midnight, Sheriff McClellan and his men had established the camp where they intended to bed down for the night. They had kept on the march until the sun sank low enough to make it impossible to go any farther. Then on McClellan's command, they had pitched camp in an open field where any approaching aggressors would be easy to spot because of the absence of concealing foliage. To make doubly sure the place was secure from attack, they had posted guards and established a periphery of defense. Luckily, the night was warm and without any threat of rain. Most of the men had blankets and sleeping bags, but there were very few tents. The posse had been organized in too big a hurry, and a lot of its members were inexperienced and did not have the proper gear for living in the woods. In addition to the normally difficult problems of feeding and supplying a posse of 40 or 50 men, there had been a myriad of pesky complaints common to novices, like poison ivy and blistered feet. Through it all, McClellan had alternately bullied and pampered the men to keep them on the move in a disciplined fashion, combing the rural areas in search of those who might require aid or rescue, until nightfall made it unwise to try to proceed any further. Then reluctantly, the gruff sheriff had given the order to pitch camp and had supervised the establishment of it in the maintenance of proper defenses. The men were tired, 
but the warmth of the campfires and smell of hot coffee went a long way toward reviving their flagging spirits. And not too long after midnight, a van arrived loaded down with box lunches for all the men so they would not have to bed down hungry. Candles and Coleman lanterns burned in various parts of the camp, giving it from a distance a rustic but cheerful look. And here and there a card game got started despite the fact that they all knew they'd have to break camp and be on the move without any breakfast come dawn. McClellan sat by himself just outside his tent, listening to the murmur of surrounding voices and the occasional rattle of a fork or spoon or a heavier piece of equipment. His maps were spread out on a field table in front of him, lighted by an overhanging lantern with a buzzing circle of gnats and other insects that intermittently annoyed McClellan by flying into his face. He was impatient to finish with the map so he could extinguish the lantern and turn in for the night. With his red pencil, he made a mark on the spot he knew to be his position, 15 miles north of a little town called Willard. Still farther north, for a stretch of several miles, there were scattered farmhouses in a tiny village or two where the inhabitants were relatively isolated and presumed to be in dire need of help. Although the status of any of the families in the area still to be combed by McClellan's posse was largely a matter of speculation because of the communications breakdown that had occurred in the early stages of the emergency. The county had been divided into sectors, each sector to be patrolled by a combination of posse volunteers and National Guard troops. The objectives were to reestablish communications in areas where lines were down or power stations were out of commission, to bring safety and law and order to villages and larger communities where order was threatened not only by marauding ghouls, but by looters and rapists taking advantage of the chaos created by the emergency and to send rescue parties out into rural or remote areas where people could be trapped in their homes with no way of defending themselves adequately or calling for help. McClellan's sector happened to be a particularly dangerous one. In addition to the normal number of recently dead from hospitals, morgues, and funeral homes, a bus full of people, the driver frightened by several of the dead things suddenly appearing in front of him as he rounded a curve, had crashed through a guardrail and over an embankment killing everyone on board, presumably. But when McClellan's posse found the bus, there were only a few ghouls wandering around aimlessly, and these were gunned down and burned. One of them, with several shattered rib bones protruding through the front of its chest, was wearing a bus driver's uniform. And from that, McClellan was pretty certain of what had happened to the other people. Long before the official announcement was made public, McClellan and his men, working hard out in the endangered areas, knew that the aggressors were dead humans and that anyone who died was likely to become an aggressor. Although many of the men carried knives and machetes to protect themselves against wounds and contamination, their procedure was to avoid tangling with the flesh eaters at close range by gunning them down at a distance. Then, by making use of meat hooks, they would drag the dead things to a pile, soak them with gasoline, and set fire to them. Anyone who had touched a meat hook or anything suspected of having been in contact with a ghoul, would wash his hands with plenty of soap and water and afterward in a solution of alcohol. It was not known whether or not these measures would be totally effective, but they had seemed to be so far, and nobody could think of what else to do under the circumstances. As McClellan had stated earlier in his news interview, his posse had suffered no losses and no casualties in the eight hours or so that it had been in the field. By splitting up into squads at times, they had managed to cover quite a number of isolated farmhouses during the hard day's trek, and had rescued some and had found some dead, with the flesh picked from their bodies. They had also gunned down quite a few when it could be seen that they were no longer dead or human. Now, with a day's experience behind him, the sheriff had the means to gauge and evaluate the tasks that lay before him. And looking on the map at the territory that remained to be combed, he figured he could do it in three or four more days by pushing the men hard. He hated to push men, but he was good at it, and there were situations like this one where it was absolutely necessary. A lot of lives might depend on just how quickly the posse was able to get to them. As McClellan slapped at a gnat that had lighted on his forehead, a heavy shadow fell across his map table and he looked up to see his deputy, George Henderson. George was a strong, wiry man of medium height wearing hunting clothes that looked well-worn and fitted his body the way that clothes will do when they are used to the body that is wearing them. He unslung his rifle and scratched the stubble of beard on his chin. 
You're standing in my light, McClellan said gruffly, his head tilted downward as though to continue scrutinizing his map. George gave a snort, which was intended to pass as a laugh, and stepped aside, disappointed that he could not think of a wisecrack to hurl back at McClellan. Instead, he said, I checked the guards. Five of the bastards were asleep. You're kidding, McClellan said, shoving himself away from his map table as though he would stomp out and crucify the five men. Yep, George said. He meant, yep, he was kidding. He chuckled, and this time McClellan was the one who merely snorted. All the guards are posted, George said. I made them take black coffee to stay awake. If any of those things get into this camp with these men in sleeping bags, a lot of them are keeping pistols in their sleeping bags with them, and the ones that don't have pistols are keeping their rifles or machetes close by. We ought to keep the fires going, McClellan said. Tell the next change of guards to keep feeding the fires all night. Okay, George said, but I already thought of it. I was going to tell them anyway. McClellan snorted as though George couldn't possibly think of such a concept on his own. You're just pissed off because you didn't think of it first, George said, and he pulled up a field chair and sat down a few feet from the table. Am I sitting in your light? He asked with a tone of mock sarcasm. Why don't you go get yourself a cup of coffee? Was McClellan's only reply, as though he was suggesting it merely to get rid of George. Did you get any? George asked. Nope. I don't want it to keep me awake. You're going to be snoozing like a big panda bear while these men are standing watch and I'm out half the night checking the guards. If you were capable of the brain work, I'd hand it over to you, McClellan said, kidding. Then you'd be the one to sleep. As it is, I've got to keep my mind fresh so this organization doesn't fall to pieces. Ha! Huh, that's a good one, George exclaimed. If it wasn't for me doing the shit work, these men would all be playing cards or shooting marbles. I want everybody out of their sacks at 4.30, McClellan broke in in a serious tone. What? 4.30. We've got to break camp and be on the move soon as we can see to navigate. Any time we spend screwing around could mean somebody else dead. How much you figure on doing tomorrow? I got 10 farmhouses I'd like to cover before noon. You can take a look at the map and see which ones. If we get that far, we'll break for lunch. We can radio ahead and let them know where we're going to be. George bent over the map and peered at it. The farmhouses that the sheriff intended to cover, marked in red, were back off a road shown on the map as a two-lane blacktop. The field where the posse was presently camped lay about two or three miles south of the blacktop road, and they had been marching in its direction all the previous day, advancing generally toward it with digressions as squads of men branched out in flanking movements to cover scattered dwellings before returning to the main body of the posse. McClellan lit a cigarette and dragged on it, while George scrutinized their previous route and sized up the one that lay ahead. The last house in their anticipated line of march was the old Miller farm, where Mrs. Miller, if she was still alive, lived with her grandson, Jimmy, a boy 11 years old. We ought to send out a separate patrol to get to this place, George said, pointing to the red X that marked the Miller farm on McClellan's map. I know Mrs. Miller, she'd be pretty helpless. She and her grandson are all alone out there. We should be there before noon, McClellan said. If they ain't dead already, they should be all right. I'm going to get me some coffee, George said. Then I'm going to rustle the second round of guards out of their sacks. Chapter 11 Surprisingly, considering the violence of the explosion, the truck stopped burning rather quickly. It had not had much gasoline in it, and when that was gone, there was very little about the truck that was combustible. Just the seats and the upholstery, and the human bodies inside, the metal with its paint charred and blistered, cooled rapidly in the night air, and the ghouls came forward, slowly at first, and clustered around the truck. The smell of burning flesh drew them closer, but the hot metal at first prevented them from attaining what enticed them, and was so near to their grasp. When the metal was cold as death, and smoke no longer curled from the ruins of the truck, the flesh eaters moved in like vultures. Tom and Judy could not feel their limbs being torn from their dead bodies. They could not hear bones and cartilage being twisted and broken and separated at the joints. They could not cry out when the ravenous ghouls ripped out their hearts and lungs and kidneys and intestines. The ghouls fought among themselves, clawed and struggled with each other for possession of the once living organs. 
Then, when possession was asserted, they went off, each to hover alone in near privacy, except for other hungry ghouls looking on, to devour whatever organ or piece of a human body the lucky ones had managed to claim. They were like dogs dragging their bones off to a corner to chew and gnaw while other dogs looked on. Several of the ghouls in search of a comfortable place to eat where they would not have to defend their meals from one another found refuge in the darkened front lawn of the old farmhouse under the big silent trees. There they waited patiently and watched the house and ate while the sound of teeth biting and ripping into dead human flesh and bone filled the night air. And constantly there was the rasp of crickets and the rasp of the heavy breathing of dead lungs mingling with the other night sounds. Chapter 12 Inside the house, the mood was one of hopelessness and despair. Barbara was once again sitting on the sofa, her vacant eyes staring into space. Harry was sulking in a corner, his head slung back in a rocking chair that creaked every time he moved, which was not very often. His face was swollen. He was holding an ice pack against his eye. His other eye, like a wandering sentinel, followed Ben who was pacing about the room. When Ben's pacing took him to the kitchen, or to some area out of Harry's sight, the good eye nervously relaxed a little. Ben's movements made virtually the only sound in the room, other than the occasional creaking of Harry's rocking chair. Ben was checking the defenses by force of habit rather than hope, while his rifle remained slung on his back. With the failure of the escape attempt, he had allowed himself to become almost totally dejected. He felt as powerless as the others who were imprisoned in the house with him. He could not think of what to try next in order to escape, yet he knew that in time they would all be doomed if they stayed put. Harry continued to watch with his good eye while Ben paced from door to kitchen to window. He started to go upstairs, stopped, checked himself, went to the door again. Suddenly there was a noise on the cellar stairs and Helen entered the living room. It's 10 minutes to three, she said to no one in particular. There'll be another broadcast in 10 more minutes. Nobody said anything. Maybe the situation has improved somehow, Helen said, without feeling much of a basis for it. You or Harry had better get downstairs and maintain a watch over your kid, Ben said. In a little while, Helen said after a long pause, I want to watch the broadcast first. Ben looked at her as though to give her an argument, but he held his tongue. He was too tired and depressed to haggle with anybody. He only hoped the little girl didn't die while they were all watching the television. Turning his back on the people in the room, he peeled back the curtain and peered through the window of the barricaded front door. Suddenly his eyes widened with fear and revulsion, but he continued to watch for a long time. There were many ghouls lurking in the shadows of the trees. Some of the things were out in the open, much nearer the house than they had dared come before. The remains of the charred bodies of several ghouls fell during the escape attempt were dimly apparent on various parts of the lawn. For some as yet unaccountable reason, the flesh eaters never bothered to devour one of their own. They preferred fresh human meat, and some of the ghouls had what they wanted, for Ben's eyes were fastened on a truly grisly scene. At the edge of the lawn in the moonlight, several ghouls were devouring what had once been Tom and Judy. They were ripping and tearing into pieces of human bodies, ghoulish teeth, biting into human arms and hands and fingers sucking and chewing on human hearts and lungs. Ben stared, fascinated and repulsed. With a convulsive movement, his fingers released the curtain as he spun around, badly shaken and faced the others, beads of perspiration on his forehead. Don't, don't. None of you look out there, Ben said, holding his stomach to keep from gagging. You won't like what you see. Harry's good eye fastened on Ben and watched him, satisfied and contemptuous to see the big man weaken. Ben moved for the television and clicked it on. Barbara's scream pierced the room. Ben jumped back from the television. She was on her feet, screaming uncontrollably. We'll never get out of here. None of us. We'll never get out of here alive, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, oh God, none of us, none of us, help. Oh God, God. Before anyone could move to her, she choked up as suddenly as she had begun and slumped, sobbing violently to the couch, her face buried in her hands. Helen tried to soothe her, but great sobs came racking from deep within. As she grew gradually quiet, the sobs diminished and stopped, 
but she remained slumped on the couch, her face covered with her hands. Helen pulled the overcoat over her, but the action seemed so futile. Barbara made no reaction whatsoever. Ben allowed himself to sink very slowly into a chair in front of the TV. Harry's good eye went from Barbara to Ben. His eye fastened on the gun, which Ben lowered butt first to the floor and leaned across his legs. His arm through the fringe sling, Ben maintained his grip on the forepiece. Harry watched. Helen bent over and placed her hand tenderly on Barbara. Come on, honey. Come and talk to me. It'll make you feel better. But Barbara made no response. Helen sat down on the other end of the sofa. Ben remained transfixed before the TV. He was lost in thought, his mind trying to come up with a solution to their dilemma. There was no more kerosene, no vehicle to escape in, and very little ammunition for the rifle. There was nothing on the TV screen, just a dull glow and low hiss of scanning lines and static. He had turned the set on too early. Harry's good eye was fastened on the gun, the sling wound around Ben's arm. Where's your car? Ben asked, the sound of his voice startling, breaking the virtual silence. Harry shifted his eye, trying to make it look as though he had not been looking in Ben's direction. We were trying to get to a motel before dark, Helen said. We pulled off the road to look at a map and those things attacked us. We ran and ran. It has to be at least a mile and a half away, Harry said bitterly, as though it satisfied him to see one of Ben's ideas thwarted, even at the cost of his own survival. It was all we could do to save Karen, Helen added. Do you think we could get to the car? Ben said. Is there any chance it would be in the clear if we could break away from this house? Not a chance, Harry said flatly. Ben shouted angrily. You give up too easy, man. You want to die in this house? I told you those things turned over our car, Harry spat. It's lying in a gully with its wheels up in the air, Helen said. Well, that's, uh, if we could get to it, maybe we could do something, Ben conjectured. You gonna turn it over by yourself, Harry said. Johnny has the keys. Keys, Barbara mumbled under her breath. But nobody heard her, because suddenly there was a loud crackle from the television and the picture and sound faded in. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Civil Defense Emergency Network. Eastern Standard Time is now 3 a.m. In most areas afflicted by this tragic phenomenon, we are seeing the first signs that it will be possible to bring things under control. Civilian authorities working hand in hand with the National Guard have established order in most of the affected communities. And while curfews are still in effect, the intensity of the onslaught does seem to be relenting and law enforcement agencies are predicting a return to normality within the near future, perhaps within the next week. Despite this word of encouragement, however, the authorities warn that a state of vigilance must be maintained. No one is certain how long the dead will continue to rise or what were the exact reasons for this phenomenon. Anyone killed or wounded by one of the aggressors is a potential enemy of live human beings. We must continue to burn or decapitate all corpses. Grizzly, as this advice sounds, it is an absolute necessity. Dr. Lewis Stanford of the County Health Department repeatedly emphasized this point in an interview taped earlier today in this television studio. The narrator faded out as the taped interview faded and Dr. Lewis Stanford, seated behind his desk, was being interviewed by a reporter holding a microphone and wearing a headset. Doctor, can you or your colleagues shed any light on the causes of this phenomenon? The doctor fidgeted in his chair and shook his head. Well, no, it's nothing that we can readily explain. I'm not going to say that we won't have an answer for you in the near future, but so far our research has yielded no conclusive answers. What about the Venus probe? The Venus probe? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not qualified to comment on that, but that is where most of the speculation has been directed, sir. Still in all, I am not an aerospace expert. I am unacquainted with that particular exploration attempt. I am a medical pathologist. What light can you shed on this, doctor? Well, I feel that our efforts have been directed properly. We're doing what we've been trained to do. That is, we are trying to discover a medical or pathological reason for a phenomenon that is without precedent in our medical history. We are treating what happened to these dead people as a disease which very probably has a biological explanation for it. In other words, it is most likely caused by microbes or viruses previously unknown to us or previously not a threat to us, 
until something happened to activate them. Whether or not the Venus probe had anything to do with this is something we couldn't determine for certain until we isolate the virus or microbe and go to Venus and find that they actually exist there. Is there a chance that whatever is causing this will spread? Will be with us permanently now? Will we have to go on burning our corpses? I don't know. I don't know. It is possible, however, that the diseased organisms which are responsible for this phenomenon are short-lived. That is, they may all die off in a short time. They may be a mutant breed that is not capable of reproduction. We are very hopeful that this will turn out to be the case. What clues have you discovered so far, Dr. Stanford? Our research is just beginning. Earlier today in the cold room at the university, we had a cadaver, a cadaver from which all four limbs had been amputated. In a short time after being removed from the cold room, it opened its eyes. It was dead, but it opened its eyes and began to move. Our problem now is to obtain more such cadavers for examination and experimentation. We have to ask the military personnel and the civilian patrols that are out in the field to stop burning all of these things, to deactivate some and bring them to us still alive so we can study them. So far, we have not been successful in obtaining many of such cadavers. Then how does this fit in with your telling people they should burn or decapitate anybody, even relatives or next of kin who dies during this emergency? That advice still holds true for the general public. If we are to obtain cadavers for examination, we want to do it in an organized way so they can be handled under sterile conditions and with as little risk as possible, both as to the parties involved and as to the danger of prolonging this emergency. The public in general should continue to burn all corpses. Just drag them outside and burn them. They're just dead flesh and dangerous. With this final word from Dr. Stanford, the TV report faded back to the live announcer. That report, which you just saw, was taped earlier today in our studio. Recapping Dr. Stanford's advice, it is still mandatory for civilians to burn or decapitate anyone who dies during this emergency. It is a difficult thing to do, but the authorities advise that you must do it. If you cannot bring yourself to do it, you must contact your local police or protection agency, and they will do it for you. Now our TV cameras take you to Washington, where late evening reporters succeeded in interviewing General Osgood and his staff as he was returning from a high-level conference at the Pentagon. Again, the commentator faded out and newsreel footage faded in. But suddenly there was a crash from outside and the lights went out. The screen went blank. The house was submerged in darkness. Ben's voice rang out. Is there a fuse box in the cellar? It's, it's not the fuse, Harry stammered. The power lines must be down. Ben squirted charcoal lighter into the embers of the fire, and with a loud whoosh, the flames leapt up. He threw a bundle of rolled up newspapers onto the fire. Then in the half light, he opened the cellar door wide and began to work his way downstairs. Harry seized Helen by the arm and pulled her face close to his so he could whisper, Helen, I've got to get that gun. We can go to the cellar, you have to help me. He had let the ice pack come away from his eye, and in the flickering light from the fire, Helen saw its blackened, swollen condition and the desperation in his face. I'm not going to help you, she whispered hoarsely. Haven't you had enough? He'd kill us both. That man is crazy, Harry argued, fighting to hold his voice to a whisper. He's already responsible for two people being dead. I've got to get that gun. Harry was cut short by the sound of Ben's footsteps at the top of the stairs, and Ben entered the room. It's not the fuse box, he announced with an air of hopelessness. I had to feel my way to it, but I found a flashlight down there. All the fuses are okay. I left the flashlight at the head of the stairs so we can see to go down. You'd better go down there and see to your daughter. She'll be... Crash! From the kitchen, the sound of splintering glass. Then more racket moans and loud crashes. The walls of the house began to shake. The dead things outside were attacking it en masse. Some of them had gotten into the den and were hammering at the barricaded door. Ben was on his feet immediately, trying to reinforce the barricades. With hammer and crowbar, he swung through the broken glass at the dead things and tried to shore up the pieces of lumber that were threatening to give way under the onslaught. Harry! Harry! Give me a hand over here! Harry came over behind Ben and instead of helping, ripped the gun from Ben's back. Holding the gun on Ben, 
Harry backed toward the cellar. Ben turned around, panicked. The things were breaking into the house. What are you up to, man? We've got to keep those things out. Now we'll see who's going to shoot who, Harry said, backing away and waving the gun in Ben's direction. I'm going to the cellar, and I'm taking the two women with me. And you can rot up here, you crazy bastard. Ignoring Harry, Ben threw his body against the window where the barricades were starting to come apart. At least a half dozen ghouls were outside the window, pounding at it, forcing the nails loose. Harry froze for a moment, transfixed by the fury of the attack and by Ben's indifference to the fact that he no longer had possession of the rifle. Harry had expected Ben to beg to be allowed to come with the others to the cellar. Purposely, Ben let the ghouls pry loose one of the largest pieces of lumber that had been nailed across the living room window. Then when it was loose, he spun and hurled it in Harry's direction. The gun was hit and knocked aside, and it fired its shot harmlessly into the floor. Ben leaped upon Harry and after a brief violent struggle, succeeded in wrenching the gun away. Helen watched, frozen in place, with the noise of the ghouls pounding in her ears. Harry backed away from Ben toward the cellar. Ben cocked and fired. Harry screamed. A great clot of blood appeared at his chest. Clutching the wound, he began to sink. He fell through the entranceway to the cellar stairs, then reeled and grabbed the banister, staggered, and fell headfirst down the stairs. Some ghouls had broken through the window, and they had Helen by the hair and by the neck, ripping and clawing at her. Ben pounded and smashed at them with the butt of the rifle. Then he leveled off and shot two of them in the face. Freed, Helen ran screaming to the cellar, and in the absence of light, she too fell and tumbled down the stairs. Her screams grew louder, as she realized she had fallen onto something large and soft, the dead body of her husband. Her hand was wet and slippery with his blood. Then out of the darkness, something stumbled toward her and moaned softly and clutched at her. Karen? It was Karen, but she was dead. Her eyes flickered in the dark. She let go of her dead father's wrist, which she had been holding to her lips. She had been chewing the tender flesh on the underside of his forearm. Helen struggled to see in the darkness. Karen? Baby? The dead little girl had a garden trowel. Silently, Staring without a word, she plunged the trowel into her mother's chest. Helen fell back, screaming and clutching, while the lifeblood gushed from her, and her daughter began stabbing her again and again. Helen's screams mingled with the other sounds of destruction echoing through the old house. Then the screams stopped, but the garden trowel continued to stab downward again and again, hacking Helen's body to bits, rending and tearing the bloody flesh. When the trowel fell from her dead, blood-stained hands, Karen bent over her mother, drooling, and bared her teeth. She dug her hands into the gaping wounds. Upstairs, Ben was continuing to fight as hard as he could, hoping to drive the things back. With the hysteria of revenge, Barbara, too, had flung herself into the attack. She smashed a chair against one aggressor, and it went down, and she threw herself upon it and beat her fists into its face. Then the thing grabbed her and they rolled and struggled, the dead creature clawing at Barbara and sinking its teeth into her neck. Ben stepped up and pointed his gun directly in the thing's face and fired, and the force of the explosion hurled the thing back, splattering Barbara with blood and bits of bone as the back of her attacker's head was blown off. She jumped to her feet, screaming and screaming, and ran straight into a cluster of ghouls that had smashed through the living room door. The ghouls seized Barbara, ripping and tearing at her and dragging her outside the house. She looked up as more attackers moved in for the kill and began to struggle for possession of her soon-to-be-dead body. One of the attackers was her brother, Johnny, back from the dead. He stared evilly, his teeth smashed and his face caked with dried blood and dirt as he moved toward Barbara and dug his fingers into her throat. She screamed and passed out, dead of shock. The ghouls dragged her out into the night, ripping her apart and digging their hands and teeth into the soft parts of her body, while groups of two or three of the flesh eaters pulled and twisted at her limbs, trying to break and tear bone and cartilage to dismember her body. Inside the house, Ben was nearly overwhelmed. At least 20 or 30 ghouls were now in the house, the barricades broken through. There was no way that Ben could continue to stand and fight. For a moment, there was a standoff as the ghouls stood and stared, confronting the man that they had trapped like a rat in a corner of a room. 
bend back toward the cellar door. Then from behind, the little girl, Karen, seized him, clawing and tearing at him, and he wheeled and grabbed her by the throat and hurled her against the wall. But she got to her feet and advanced toward him, her face smeared with her mother's blood, and the other ghouls, too, had started to advance. Ben stepped onto the cellar stairs, slamming the door behind him and frantically barricading it as the ghouls pounded and smashed at the door in the walls. The sounds of their rasping breath and their insane pounding and smashing filled Ben's ears as he trembled and hoped that the barricade would hold. Though the pounding continued for a long time, the door seemed to be strong. The ghouls seemed unable to break it down. Ben sat there in the dark, overwhelmed by the hopelessness of his situation and the fact that everybody was dead who had tried to hold out in the old house. Everybody but him. Then his fingers closed around the flashlight that he had left there earlier when he had come to check out the fuse box. In turning it on and pointing its beam of light ahead of him, he began to descend into the basement. In the peripheral illumination from the beam of the flashlight, Ben looked at his arm and, with a shock, saw that he was bleeding. The girl, Karen, she had bitten him in their struggle. Frozen on the stairs, Ben stared at the teeth marks in his arm. If he died, he was going to become, unless a cure could be found. He did not allow his mind to complete the horrible thought of what might happen to him. The pounding of the ghouls at the cellar door was growing weaker and more half-hearted. The flesh eaters, content to devour and fight over the remains of the slaughtered Barbara, were wandering out of the house, out into the yard, where groups of ghouls were already sinking their teeth into warm human flesh and organs, and gnawing at human bone. At the foot of the stairs, the beam of Ben's flashlight fell on the ash-white dead face of Harry Cooper, with his arm half-chewed through at the elbow. And slowly, in a little while, Harry's eyelids began to flutter and come open. Chapter 13. The sounds of men breaking camp disturbed the normal hush and silence of the woods in the gray dawn. A damp mist hung over the field where the men had slept, and as they straggled to assemble in the clearing which McClellan had designated, white breath hissed from their mouths and nostrils and hovered around them as they walked. They did not talk much, but they stuck close together in little groups, in case one of the dead things should attack them out of the fog. George Henderson spat on the ground and said to the sheriff, It's a wonder how it could be so warm last night and so cold this morning. Maybe we got some rain moving in. Nah, McClellan said. I checked the weather report. The sun'll come up and burn this fog in a few hours. It'll be hell if it rains, and these men have to slog through mud, George said. There'll be some people that won't get rescued. As the two men talked, a white Jeep station wagon, its engine growling, nosed its way in circles through the tall, damp grass. As two posse men, fully armed, followed along behind the Jeep, stopping here and there to pick up bedrolls and packed up tents and throw them on board. The campfires had all been doused. There were beds of wet, black coals scattered throughout the field in proximity to the tents and bedrolls. Hurry it up, men, McClellan yelled. How'd you like it if your wife or daughter was waiting for you to haul ass and save her from those things? The men stepped it up a little bit. Soon they were all assembled in the clearing under the trees, where McClellan's tent had been pitched. Chapter 14 The circle of light on Harry Cooper's face grew larger as Ben descended the staircase. Ben moved the flashlight quickly to take in the whole picture. Harry lay dead in a pool of blood. His arm chewed halfway through. Helen lay dead too, not far away, a garden trowel protruding from her hacked-up chest. With an additional flutter of his eyelids, Harry opened his eyes wide. Then he began to sit up. Holding the flashlight and the gun at the same time, Ben stepped as close as he dared and took careful aim. He quivered but pulled the trigger and was jolted by recoil as the top of Harry's head was blown off and the loud report of the rifle echoed in the dank basement. Ben looked down, moving the flashlight and pointing it. He shuddered as he thought he could see splatters of blood on the bottoms of his trouser legs. Then he remembered Helen, and he pointed the flashlight in her direction. Her face and hair were caked with blood. Blood had come in a stream from her mouth and nostrils, and several of her teeth were broken and twisted. Her ribs, where some flesh had been eaten away, showed glistening white in the beam of the flashlight. In a little while, she opened her eyes and Ben fired. 
Her body heaved and twitched with an abrupt convulsion as the bullet smacked into her brain. Ben threw the rifle down and covered his eyes with his hands. Tears rolled down his checks as he stepped over the dead bodies. Moving the flashlight around, he was overcome by the loneliness and the dismalness of the dark cellar, and his eyes fell on the makeshift table that had been Karen's sickbed. In a fit of rage, he overturned the table and hurled it to the floor with a crash. Then he staggered about aimlessly in his grief, stumbling over objects in the dark as though they weren't there if the flashlight failed to show them. Tom, Judy, Barbara, Harry, Helen, all dead. If only the truck hadn't caught fire. If only, if only. Gathering his senses together somewhat, Ben picked up the rifle and cocked it. He looked all around, pointing the gun in the flashlight. His eyes scanned his surroundings for possible areas of threat or vulnerability. Moving around slowly and quietly, holding his breath, though it wanted to come gasping out of him, he probed behind the packing crates and in the dark corners of the cellar. There was nobody around. Nobody in hiding, just the dead bodies of Harry and Helen Cooper. Ben sat in a corner, leaning against a wall of concrete block, and cried softly. He looked down at the wound on his arm and at the blood splattered on his trousers. Upstairs, the noise of the ghouls had stopped. Perhaps a few were still in the house, lurking silently. From exhaustion, finally Ben's head nodded and he yielded to an agonized, nervous sleep. His last thoughts were of his children. Chapter 15, sunrise, bird sounds, then the sounds of dogs and human voices, the rising sun, bright and warm, dew on the high grass of a meadow, more sounds in the distance, the whir of a helicopter, men with dogs and guns working their way up from the woods that surrounded the meadow, shouts, muffled talk, panting and straining of dogs against leashes, Sheriff McClellan's posse. Chapter 16. Ben nodded and snapped awake, startled, unsure of his surroundings. He thought he heard a helicopter, or maybe he was dreaming. He listened. Nothing. Then in the distance, a beating of metal wings. A helicopter. Definitely. Ben clutched the rifle and listened and looked all around. The basement was not dark any longer, but it was not bright either. It was dusky and dank illuminated in varying shades of gray by whatever sunlight could filter through the high tiny windows. The helicopter sounds continued to fade in and recede. Ben strained his ears but could hear no other signs of human activity. Finally, stepping gingerly and trying not to look, he got past the corpses of Helen and Harry Cooper and began to sneak up the cellar stairs. The stairs creaked, startling him, but he paused only momentarily then continued his ascent toward the barricaded door. Chapter 17. A few men, some German shepherds on leashes, came up out of the woods and onto the edge of the sunlit, dewy meadow. They stopped and looked all around, as if they were scrutinizing the meadow for possible danger. The boots and trouser legs of the men were damp from plodding through the wet grass. Sheriff McClellan was the next man up from the surrounding thicket. He was breathing hard because of his weight and the difficult job of leading the men through the woods when none of them had had any rest or any breakfast. He was armed with his rifle and pistol, with a belt of ammunition slung over his shoulder. He paused, looked back over his shoulder into the woods, and mopped perspiration from his brow with a balled-up, dirty handkerchief. More men were still working their way out of the woods into the clearing. McClellan shouted at them, Come on, let's step it up now. Never can tell what we'll run into up here. His voice broke off as his deputy, George Henderson, came over to him and opened his mouth to say something. But McClellan spoke first. You keeping in touch with the squad cars, George? George was wearing a sweatband and carrying a rifle and a sidearm. And he also had a walkie-talkie strapped on his back. Breathing hard, he hunched and adjusted the straps of his burden. Yeah, they know where we are. They should be intercepting us at the Miller farmhouse. Good, McClellan said. These men is dog-tired. They can use some rest and hot coffee. Then looking back toward the men moving up from behind, he shouted, Let's push along now. The squad cars will be waiting with coffee and sandwiches at the house. The men continued to push on across the meadow, and soon they began to work their way cautiously into the strip of woods on the other side. 
Chapter 18 At the top of the cellar stairs, Ben was listening as intently as he could behind the barricade. For a long time, he had not been able to hear any helicopter sounds. Perhaps it had landed somewhere or flown away. Ben wished he could have been upstairs so he could wave to it from the lawn. Then, from far off, he heard the distinct sound of a dog barking. He listened for a long time but heard nothing more. He was tempted to undo the barricade and take his chances on going out there to look around. Chapter 19 When the men worked their way through the narrow belt of trees on the far side of the meadow, they came out into a cemetery, the one Barbara and John had come to with the wreath for their father. The posse continued its advance, threading its way among the grave markers. Down a dirt road and up a short grade, the men found Barbara's car with the smashed window. The headlight switch was on, but the battery was dead. There were no signs of blood, and the men could not find any corpses anywhere near the car. Maybe whoever was in here escaped and got away, McClellan said hopefully. Move on, men. We can't do any good here. The men passed through the cemetery and out onto the two-lane blacktop road, where several squad cars were parked, waiting. There were also one or two motorcycle patrolmen, and one of them dismounted and hailed McClellan. Hi, Sheriff. How's things going? McClellan advanced, mopping his brow, and stopped to shake hands with the motorcycle patrolman. Meanwhile, the men in the posse began to catch up and regroup. McClellan said, Sure glad to see you fellows, Charlie. We've been at it damn near all night, but I don't want to break till we get to the Miller house over there. We might be screwing around while somebody needs our help. We'll see. First, then stop and get some coffee. Sure, Sheriff. The two men looked around at the gathering posse, which was beginning to fill up the neck in the blacktop road. Get started over that wall and through that field, George Henderson shouted with the walkie-talkie on his back. The Miller farmhouse is over there. He took the time to unsling the walkie-talkie and hand it to one of the cops in a squad car. Then leading a squad of men, he began to move toward the field in front of the Miller house. Gunshots rang out almost immediately. Ghouls, ghouls all over the place a voice yelled. A bevy of gunshots split the air. More men moved up, running and firing from behind trees. The police dogs growled and strained at their leashes, hating the scent of the dead things. The posse advanced in squads across the field and toward the shed with the gasoline pumps, where several of the flesh eaters were lurking and trying to get away, but they were gunned down. Nearer the house, there were still more ghouls and firing repeatedly. The squads of men moved forward, felling the dead things with a trail of bullets. There were more of the creatures trying to hide in and around a burned out truck, but they were unsuccessful. They tried to run, but the posse gunned them down. Each time a ghoul fell, one of the men moved forward and hacked at it with a machete until the head was severed from the body. That way they knew the ghoul would not get to its feet again. For better than half an hour, the echo of gunshots was constant in the field surrounding the old Miller farmhouse. Chapter 20. Still at the top of the cellar stairs, Ben knew for sure now that there were men outside. The gunshots were undeniable, and he even thought he had heard a car engine. But he was afraid to open the door because some of the creatures might still be in the house. Yet, he knew he was going to have to open the door. Slowly, quietly, he began undoing the heavy barricades. Chapter 21. McClellan fired and the dead thing 50 feet in front of him clutched at its face with a convulsive movement and toppled to the earth like a sack of potatoes with a dull thud. More gunshots rang out, and two more of the ghouls fell heavily to the ground. Get up here, boys, McClellan yelled. There's three more for the fire. The men with machetes moved up and hacking quickly and furiously, severed the heads from the dead ghouls. The sheriff and his men had advanced to the lawn of the old farmhouse and were crouching and firing repeatedly, blasting down the dead creatures that surrounded the place. Shoot for the eyes, boys, McClellan cried out. Like I told you before, always aim right for the eyes. The flurry of gunfire was constant. Crack, 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 as the posse surrounded the house. Then there was silence as all the ghouls had apparently been felled, and the men's eyes scanned the old place and its environs, looking for a new target to gun down. Suddenly from the house, a loud noise. George Henderson had moved up beside McClellan, and the two of them watched and listened, frozen in their tracks. 
There's something in there, Henderson said unnecessarily. I heard a noise. Inside, ready to shoot or swing, Ben had slammed open the cellar door. The force of his shoulder against the door had carried him into the living room, which was empty. There were no ghouls lurking there. There was only the ramshackle destruction from the recent siege. Ben edged his way through the twisted wreckage and overturned furniture toward the front door. There was no light in the place. Despite the early morning sunlight, it remained dark under the heavy foliage of the surrounding trees. Some of the barricades partially remained, although weakened and widened for entry by the marauding ghouls. Ben's hands crept to what was left of a curtain. He pulled it back and started to peek out. But a shot rang out, and Ben reeled, driven back, a circle of blood on his forehead, right between his eyes. Simultaneously, McClellan shouted, Damn it! What'd you shoot for? I told you to be careful. There might be people in there. The posse member who had fired the shot said, Nah, you can see this place is demolished. Anybody in there be dead. And if they're dead, several men led by George Henderson advanced to kick in the front door. They stepped back and peered cautiously inside. Their faces searched the room. A patch of sunlight from the open door fell partially on Ben. He was dead. The men looked down at him without pity as they stepped past him to the cellar. They did not know he was a man. Squads of men began to enter the house, moving cautiously through the rooms in military fashion, checking for possible aggressors lurking inside. Two men with machetes came forward and began hacking at Ben, severing his head from his body. Somebody put up a good fight here, McClellan said to George Henderson later, when they were sipping black coffee on the front lawn near a squad car. It's a damn shame they couldn't hold out a while longer. I wonder who it was, Henderson replied, taking a bite of his sandwich. It wasn't Mrs. Miller. We found what was left of her, upstairs in her room, but we didn't find any trace of her grandson. I guess we ain't never gonna know, said the sheriff. But then again, there's lots of things we ain't going to know about this damn business. Chapter 22. Ben's head and body were heaved onto the bonfire with the rest, and the meat hook was yanked out of his chest with a hard tug on the part of the gloved hand that was yanking it. Then the lumber and the dead bodies were drenched in gasoline by still another pair of gloved hands. And the touch of a flaming torch set the whole thing ablaze. The men stared into the broiling hot fire and watched flesh curling and melting from dead bone, much as the paint curls and melts from a burning blackening page of newsprint. They backed away from the heat finally and went to where they could discard their meat hooks and gloves and wash their hands in sterile alcohol. But they could not escape the stench of burning flesh. 